So as we, um, as I said, we're going we're gonna to talk today about when we think about the, the class we did on the art of parenting, and we're going to look at the life of Timothy as we look at this. And so if you look at it, we're going to talk about the formation of godly character as a lesson from the life of Timothy. If you think about it as parents, probably one of the most important things that we, that we are responsible for is forming the character of our kids, right? And even as grandparents, you can have a significant impact on kids. Or maybe you're saying, look, I, I don't even have kids. But you can touch into the lives of others, and you can make an impact on the youth, right? Because they're the next generation, and that's where it's so critical. With that, let's go ahead and pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just ask that your spirit be in this place. Lord, Heavenly Father, just as we look at your word, we thank you that you gave us such powerful examples in Scripture. And Lord, we just ask that you allow us to look at these examples and how we can impact that onto our own lives. And then we pray, amen. So our anchor text for today is we're looking at 2 Timothy. And if we look at these words, it says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and have firmly believed, knowing from whom you have learned it, whom from childhood you have been acquainted with the sacred writings, which are able to make you wise for salvation through faith in Christ Jesus. So if we look at, these, at this scripture verse and we think about, so this is Paul writing to Timothy. One of the first things that we see is Paul tells Timothy to be firm in his faith because he knows from whom he learned it. Now, where did Timothy learn the scriptures? From his mom and his grandma, right? We see that the hand here where the grandma's reaching in and impacting Timothy. So he can have assurance in what he believes because he knows from whom he learned it. And we see here that from childhood, right, the grandmother and the mother are imparting scripture on Timothy. And so why is that important? Like, it's great and wonderful that Timothy learned these scriptures and the grandma was there and she was doing this and she had this impact, but why? And, he, and Paul goes on and he says, all scripture is breathed out of God. And by the way there, um, for those of you that weren't at Vespers, our first fundamental belief is on the scriptures. And when we did that, that Vespers session, we actually got into the Greek, and I took the Greek language here, and we actually broke this down and looked at it. And when Paul is saying this, this is literally as if God is speaking, right? It's, it's breathed. It's the very word of God, right? We get this essence when we look at the original Greek. And so it says all scripture and in some versions, like the NIV or the King James, they actually translate it as inspired, right? But the actual Greek is what's translated here in the English Standard Version. I like the ESV. It's a little bit more accurate than most other translations. It's more closely to the Greek. And it says, all scripture is breathed out of God and is profitable for what? For teaching, for reproof, for correction, and for training in righteousness. Right? So the reason we have scripture is for these aspects, right? It, when you start looking at all of the different issues that are going on in the world and the different issues that are tearing apart the world, and right now the church is under attack, and there's a lot of issues that are tearing apart and attacking and just dealing with issues in the church. And in the end, we just got to come down and say, look, is the Bible accurate, yes or no? And if we truly believe the scriptures and we believe that it's from God and that they're accurate, then we just interpret all these issues from the point of scripture, period. And it's done. There, there is no debate because God's made it clear. And then we use those teachings and those te 
the, the word is able to do what? To teach us, to guide us, to reprove us. And then we just live out based off what we find in the scriptures, right? And then these issues don't become an issue. I don't understand why there's so much fighting. Um, it was interesting. We, we went up to a conference meeting, and there was a big topic there that was arguing and fighting. And I heard, and I, I, OK and I were talking about this. I, I couldn't speak, because I represent the, I'm the secretary for the Articles and Regulations Committee. So we look at the legal articles of the church, and we're responsible for maintaining it. And I'm, technically a guest there along with the, the president of the union and I'm sitting next to him and it was killing me. We like debate for over and over and all this time and not once did someone get up and quote the word of God. And I was like, uh, hello, like <laughs> why? And I just, I so badly wanted to get up and scream, but I, I couldn't because um, I'm sitting there as like the lawyer doing my job, right? I'm not there to do that. And I'm like, why did not a single person quote scripture? This issue would have been easily solved. You open up the word of God and we do it. But instead, you had all these representatives sitting there arguing and debating for, forever until finally we called an end to the debate and a vote. and It was done. But it was just kind of funny. It's like, if we truly believe the word of God is the word of God, then it just becomes the center, right? And everything else goes out from it. it. The Word of God isn't just something you read casually. It's the center. And we use it for teaching and for reproof and for correction and training in righteousness, right? And it says, and the man of God may be equipped for every good work, right? So that's why the scriptures are important. So here's my key thought for today. And we're going to go back to this multiple times. It says, we're to display God's character in our lives with Jesus' life as our example. So my question to you is, whose character are you projecting? Whose character are you projecting? You know, I, it was interesting when we were doing the, the parenting class, one of the things we had to do is we had to look at, and we had to list what characteristics we wanted in our children. So in the, this Art of Parenting class, part of what we did was, we looked at it as we were to launch our children into the world, and so we were to be building like an arrow to throw them out. The whole, the whole lesson, all eight weeks, was focused around archery, right? And so like if you think about an archer launching an arrow, right? And our kids are the arrow, and we're the archer with the bow, and we're launching them out. And one of the first things we had to do is we had to list like, what character do we want from our kids? Like what characteristics? Um, and so, you know, for me, one of the two big ones was that they had a biblical worldview, right? So that when they look at a scenario, the first thing they do is what? They look at scripture, scripture is the center, and they interpret it based off that, right? That's what we just read, right, in 2 Timothy. And thirdly was that they were others focused, right? They're focused not on themselves, but they're focused on others. They're others focused. It's interesting, you know, their secular humanism says that humans are perfect and then they come into the world and then they are then corrupted. And my answer to any of them is none of them have had kids. When a little kid comes out as a toddler, separate from saying mom, the next word that comes out of their mouth is what? Mine. Right? Mine. Mine, mine. And you're fighting with them nonstop. And I always joke with William sometimes, you do stuff, and I'm like, William, didn't in kindergarten they teach you to share? He's like, not in kindergarten. I don't remember them teaching me that. I'm like, you know. But it's, it's funny, right? It's, it's, we're so focused, and most people are me, me, me. And I see that as one of the most central problems in our world, right? You're beyond the road, and people are cutting you off, and they're doing crazy stuff. Because all they're focused on is they're late or they're doing something else and they're focused on who? Them. And in most issues and problems that you see in our lives and in our world, it's because everyone's focused on who? Self. But what would Jesus teach us? Jesus taught us we were supposed to be focused on who? Others. And so, you know, I ask you, whose character are you projecting? Are we projecting Jesus? 
And here's why. Our children are a mirror of us. Do you realize that? They're a mirror of us. And one of the things in there, we were looking at it, when we were looking at that lesson, we were looking at different characteristics. And I, I realized as I was preparing my sermon, I was really kind of mad at myself. I, I was looking at it and I was like, wait a minute, if I want my children to be patient and kind and loving, then that means I have to do it for myself. So I was gonna make, I committed to make a poster with that and I was gonna put it in my office by my laptop and by my bed. So that every morning when I got up and when I'm sitting at my laptop and I'm looking at my computer, I see those attributes. And then I can ask myself, wait a minute, if I want my children to be loving, am I being loving? If I want my children to be patient, Am I being patient? If I want my children to be kind, am I being kind? Because if I don't display that character, where are my children going to learn it from? Right? This leads us to looking at Timothy. So who is Timothy, right? Who's Timothy? So begin with, we know that he had a Jewish mother and a Greek father. We know that he was raised knowing God. And we know that he served at least in five churches. Interestingly enough, I don't know, people never talk about it. Timothy is actually one of the most impactful characters in all of the New Testament. Did you guys realize that? He is spoken of in 11 of the 13 writings in the New Testament by Paul. So separate from the four Gospels, there is no one individual mentioned more, but yet we pass over them, don't we? We completely pass over them. No one talks about like, like how many times do you guys get up and people say, hey, I want to think about Timothy. But yet he was one of the most impactful people inside the New Testament. 11 of Paul's writings specifically talks about Timothy. And Paul specifically refers to him as his son. So for example, with the Corinthians, he says, hey, I am sending Timothy my son, so he can teach you what I want you to know, right? He served in at least five churches with Paul. And so, right, we see this again. This is from 2 Timothy, right? Um, or sorry, this is from the book of Acts. So in the book of Acts, chapter 16, it says Paul came, right, to the cities, and there's Timothy, the son of a Jew, right? So this is where you get this. And he said, and he was well spoken of by the brothers. And so one of the things we also see is that Timothy was well respected. Now, he was a young man when he started going with Paul, right? He was probably a teenager. But yet he's already well spoken of. And so Paul wanted him to accompany him. And so he took him with him. So our first point that we see is that formation of godly character starts where in the home it starts in the home you know it's interesting so i <clears throat> so i'm super busy all the time and so um and a lot of times i'm by myself working on projects i have to have noise around me so i don't get like depressed i'm a very much an extrovert so i listen i have podcasts on and i love um, the huberman lab he's a professor of neurobiology i love geeking out on the science i sit and listen to him um, as well as um, Jim Quick from Quick Learning. And I also like looking at their stuff of like, how do I format my life? How do I improve my life? How do I, you know, learn more? How do I learn faster? How am I more efficient with my time? How, like all these different things. And it was interesting to me because one day I was doing dishes and I just listened to that. I came up from my office, was doing dishes, and I realized that I actually had a lot of those habits already. And then I started looking at it, and I was like, well, wait a minute, where did I learn these? Where did I get this? And what I realized was I got them from my grandparents, right? When I was a kid growing up, I mean, we did devotions as a family, but like when you went to grandma and grandpa's house, the Bible was right there on the table. You ate breakfast, and then we immediately did devotions right there, right? led by grandma and grandpa. And you know, I think about it with William and the kids, I pushed it like, hey, you gotta do breakfast and immediately devotions. Where did I learn that? Grandma and grandpa's house, because you would never go to grandma and grandpa's house and eat a meal 
and not then open up the Bible. It literally sat on the dining room table, right? I don't remember ever a moment that I don't remember seeing my grandmothers both on both sides in the morning reading their Bibles afterwards. They didn't push us on us. They didn't tell us to do it. There wasn't like this, you must do it, where they nagged us. They just simply went into their, after we had breakfast and they cleaned up the breakfast table, they simply went in and read their Bible. And I, I think about it and I'm like, wait a minute, that was like the most visible evidence, right? I walk like anywhere to 12 to 15,000 steps a day. I love walking. In fact, I get the kids out of school, get them going, and then I go and I walk several miles and I do my own devotion and things like that. And I'm like, well, okay, so that's, I'm like listening to all these speakers telling me how great it is. And I'm like, oh yeah, my grandmother, my grandmother was in the middle of seven kids. So she had a hard time spending time with dad, right? Well, my great grandfather purposely had his paper delivered to his office two miles from his house. So every morning he got up, walked two miles to his office, got the paper, walked back home, opened the paper while eating breakfast, and then pulled out his Bible after breakfast and did devotions. My grandma in her, in her mid-90s, before COVID hit, still got up from that habit she learned from her father. And again, she wanted to spend time with dad. She's number, like, in the middle of seven kids. So what's the easiest way to spend time with dad? Get up early and go walk with dad. And so in her mid-90s, she was still getting up every morning walking several miles, coming back and doing devotions, and then she'd clean up and go to the nursing home to take care of people 20 years younger than her. And I was like, oh yeah, no wonder I walk every morning right after breakfast, because what did I see visibly every time I visited grandma, every time I did it? And then I asked her one time, I was like, where'd you get this? I got it from your great-grandfather, right? So when I started looking at the habits of my life that formed my character, it came from my grandmothers, they probably had the biggest impact on who I am and my character. Because when I started looking at the attributes of my life and my attributes of discipline, it wasn't that it was forced on me, it wasn't that someone ever said anything to me, I simply observed it in my grandmothers. And to this day, it impacts my life, amen? Your first formation of godly character is in the home, right? Deuteronomy says, <clears throat> and these are the words I command you today that shall be in your heart. You shall teach them diligently to your children, and you shall talk to them when you sit at the house, and when you walk by the way, and when you lie down, and when you rise. You shall bind them as a sign to your hands, and you shall put them on your frontlets between your eyes, and you shall write them on your doorpost for your house and for your gates. So what does Deuteronomy say we're supposed to do? We're supposed to do what? Take the word of God and teach it to our children, right? In Psalms 112, one to two, it says, blessed is the man who fears the Lord, who greatly delights in his commandments, why? Because his offspring will be mighty in the land, and the generation of the upright will be blessed. Right? So our first mission field is our home and our neighbors. And some of you might be listening online or sitting in here and you're saying, look, I don't have, like, the grandkids coming around, or my kids are grown. I don't have children anymore, right? But you have a neighbor, right? that you can go and you can talk to and you can witness to. Um, some of you guys, well, actually not, only a couple of you guys have been here long enough to remember Dave and Rhonda that used to come. That happened because Dave came over to my house to help me move, and then he tried, he's like, hey, he tried giving me alcohol, and I'm like, hey, I don't drink. And so then he's like, hey, um, why don't we go get a cigar? I'm like, hey, I, I'm sorry, I don't smoke. And then he's like, hey, let's go get a great steak. I'm like, sorry, I'm a vegetarian. <laughs> And so um, it came then time for Lent, and he was like, hey, I'm, you know, I'm Catholic. I'm supposed to not eat meat. Man, I love meat. You're a vegetarian. And I'm like, great. Why don't you come to my house every Friday? I'll help you cook Lent, or keep Lent by cooking you a good vegetarian meal. But in exchange, you have to be willing to open the Word of God with me, and let's sit and study the Word of God. 
And so that's how he ended up coming to the church, right? And so I just simply shared a meal with him, right? I reached him where he was. And then we just, you know, we had a meal and we would pray and we'd open the word of God and I let it go where, where I was. I had no agenda. I pushed absolutely nothing. Whatever he wanted to talk about, that's what we talked about, right? You can, your, your first mission field is your home. Secondly, is that Paul engaged Timothy as a youth in leadership and responsibility. You notice this, he served in five churches, right? He served in five churches as a teenager. If Paul, in fact, if Paul needed to send a message to a church, who did he send? Timothy. And we see this when you start, again, if you look in the book of Corinthians, if you look in the book of Philippians, if you look in the book of Thessal Thessalonians, it starts with, I am sending you Timothy to teach you the word, right? He was sending Timothy. I, I love it. Like, you know, if you really want to engage your, your youth, you have to give them leadership. You have to give them responsibility. I love that we have kids working back there um, on the AV stuff. It's amazing and wonderful, right? Um, I miss having the kids up front. Laura did that, and when Laura left, it ended. Um, I remember when you were up there when you were little, and now you're all grown and in college, right? I, I desperately miss having our little kids there. You know, I was thinking about it as I was looking at Timothy and I was preparing the sermon. You know, my first job, actually, I always say my first job was washing dishes when I was 16, but technically, my birthday was in August. That summer before, I served as a missionary, right? And our church was very engaged about taking teenagers and putting them with the adults. So what we did is members of the church would open up their house and invite the kids from their neighborhood, and then we would go and do Bible studies, like vacation Bible schools in their backyards. They would just open up their house, invite all the kids from the neighborhood, right? So they would pair a team with adults, they would do teams of it, right? And so technically, really, that was my first job. And then I got, I got to raise money and get paid like a missionary. Um, when I was in high school, I was able to help teach the kids, right? So when we, if we really want to like shape our kids, we have to engage them in leadership when they're young and give them responsibility. Um, and then from there, they can grow, right? And so we need to be looking and finding ways where we can really engage our youth. The next one is that Paul mentored and discipled the foundation of Timothy's godly character. You know, if we really think about it, one of the most impactful and powerful things we can do is mentoring. So we're getting ready to have our men's breakfast tomorrow, right? And what I would say is, as men in the church, one of our most important missions is to teach boys how to be men, right? Anybody can be a father, right? We can go mess around with the girl and there you go. But it takes a real man to step up, right, and truly show them fatherhood, right? I guess it's probably the other way around. Anybody can be a dad, it takes a real man to be a father, right? And one of the most important things we can do is, is forming there. I, I remember, so when Sandra and I, so when I went to grad school, when I went to law school, um, we led the Pathfinder Club. We were actually, Sandra and I were the directors of the Pathfinder Club at the church we were at. And um, I remember there were some of the kids there that didn't have dads, right? And so their, their grandmas, I remember one of them specifically, always hounded me, like, it is your job the step in, and I, I remember being scared about this. We actually talked about it in the, the Art of Parenting class. And looking back on it, as we were talking about it in the Art of Parenting class, I'm, it was a little stupid and silly, because I went to grad school pretty late. I went after the military, so I was, oops. Um, did not mean to do that. Whoops, there, thank you. Um, I, I was like in my late 20s. So if I really think about it, I had plenty of friends that already had kids in their late 20s. Um, I was just still goofing off and being a kid. So it <laughs> wasn't, like, in my mind, I'm like, I'm a little kid still. How in the world can I be, like, a disciple to a 10-year-old, a, a 12-year-old boy when I'm a goofy kid still myself? I'm like, we're the same mentality. Um, which is silly, because like I said, if I really thought about it, most of my friends already had kids. I just, you know, was late doing any of that stuff in life. I didn't have kids until I was almost 40. 
So, you know, but that's, that was a great opportunity. And I really, I look back on it, and I think it's one of the areas I failed. And I really am frustrated at myself because I had a great opportunity with some of those boys to really shape them because they didn't have a father figure and they were there at the church. Their grandmas were bringing them. And that's one of our most important things we can do as men, right? Is to teach boys how to be men. And not to be rude, and I'm going to get trashed on this probably on social media for those watching it, but a woman can't raise a man to be a man. It takes a man to show them what it means to be a man. I'm sorry, right? Our prisons are full, full of men that had no father figure. And they talk about it all the time with the statistics. The statistics on it are unbelievable when you look at it. It's, it's upwards of more than two-thirds of the men in prison did not have an active father figure, or if they did have a father figure, it was the boyfriend that was bouncing in with the mom and they had three or four boyfriends, right? We need to learn to mentor and disciple. And as parents, this is one of the critical things, right? It's not to be a friend, you're not to be your kid's friend, which is hard for me, because I'm still goofy, even though I'm like, you know, 50. Um, so I'm probably, if William's in timeout, you can guarantee I'm there with him because I probably caused it. The best example was one time when Victoria or uh, Sandra was gone and William and I were having a rather destructive, crazy Nerf gun fight all over the house and Victoria scolded us. And so I did the most mature thing possible. I shot her with a Nerf gun, uh, even though she wasn't involved in which she commits to take the Nerf gun and put both of us in timeout which is really rough when your 15 year old puts you in timeout. But anyhow, so, right, so, but that's not our job, right? <laughs> so to be a friend to your kid, your, your job is to be a mentor. Your job is to disciple them. And we see this in how Paul worked with Timothy and brought him up, right? Um, and so I'm gonna skip past this. Um, oops, no, that one I did at once. Sorry, my slides got messed up. The wrong version got uploaded. It says, but I say, walk in the spirit, and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desire of the spirits are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, and to keep you from doing these things you want to do. But if you're led by the spirit, you are not under the law. So one of the biggest things we can look at as we're discipling our kids is to ensure that they're filled with the Holy Spirit and ensure that we're filled with the Holy Spirit, amen? Because then we can actually do this, right? Think about it. If I'm taking my kids to church and I'm telling them to be a great kid and I'm doing all this stuff on Sabbath and then during the week I'm living according to the, the world, what's going to happen to the kid? What are they going to see? They're going to see hypocrisy. They're going to see the world. And guess what's going to happen? Where that kid going to be as soon as they hit 18? Gone and out of the church. Right? And so one of the most important things we can do is we can start looking at it and saying, wait a minute, am I filled with the Spirit? So that I can then do what? Display those fruit to those in my home. Right? So the infilling of the Holy Spirit is really that key to Christian living and true freedom. Oh, you're going to hang up. That's someone trying to call. I yeah, just hang up on them. That's okay. Sorry. We're getting a phone call in the back. Um, so with that, I want to go because we're getting toward the end, and I want to I bring it to a close because we got started kind of late. So um, I want to skip, skip forward a bit. It says, so again, I want to relook at this. It says, but as for you, continue in what you have learned and firmly believe, knowing whom you learned it and how from childhood you've been acquainted with the sacred writings, right? So again, if we start looking at this, our greatest mission is right here. So if you're not doing studies with your kids, you really need to do it, right? I'll tell you, it's interesting. So we, we do, I do devotions with the kids in the morning, and then we do family devotions at night. And, you know, when they were little, I taught them the Bible stories, because that was really easy, right? So we just sat there, and we, we would read the Bible stories, 
I would do funny voices, sometimes oxily or whatever, and get the kids giggling to help them remember it. Um, they had particular ones that they were their, their favorites, right? Um, and when we were doing the art of parenting class, and then from there we started doing like the books, right? You guys can buy the little devotion books, right? And I realized it was interesting when they were little, we would sit in one of their rooms and we would sit as a family on the floor all together and we would read it and then we would talk it. I would quiz the kids, right? So I would read a Bible story and then I would quiz them on the story, right? And then as I got older, we kind of like, kids get busy when they're teenagers. It's crazy how busy teenagers are, or we let them be maybe. Maybe it's my fault for letting my kids be super busy. They're super busy. So sometimes they come home late, and so we started getting lazy to where I would just sit in the hallway between their doorways, and I would read one of those pre-done devotion books. And what I noticed was everything with the kids and their attitude and everything toward it started going like this. And what I, when I really sat back and started thinking about it, there was only one point of blame there, and it wasn't the kids. It was me, because I was failing as their father, right? I wasn't discipling them. I wasn't mentoring them. I wasn't leading. I wasn't doing this. So when we started doing Art of Parenting, and we started looking at all the different stuff, and we started discussing, and I'll tell you, one of the most powerful things of it, it wasn't just the lessons. It was the talking. Like, it was amazing having Tracy and Patrick in there. I just love them so much. I appreciate them so much. And being able to like have that experience as well as like, you know, in the church, out of the church and just the difference there. And, and you know, also oral and stuff like that. The people that were in there and Bradley, we were able to share our stories and Sam and look at stuff, right? And you're able to analyze your own life and be like, wow, where is my own dysfunction, right? Like, I think that was the most powerful part of it. It was the, it was the talking, it was the discussing to where I could self-analyze and be like, wow, where am I broken, right? Where am I failing? And where, what's the advice? What are you doing, right? I, and there's people in this church we have to do that. There's so many times where I get frustrated with stuff, and there, there's thankfully other men in this church who have teenagers older than mine, and I can go to them and be like, I am at my wit's end. What do I do, right? And that, I think, was probably the most powerful part of the art of parenting. But, I, you know, I was in there... And I, we were talking about this. And so I made a commitment. I told Sandra, I said, this is ridiculous. We're really failing. Like, I'm, I'm feeling like I'm failing as a father, right? So I said, we got to go back to what we did. So I said, that's it. I made a de declaration with the kids. I said, back in the living room, no matter what, 9 o'clock, all electronics off, period. I'm taking your phones away, right? iPhone's gone, 9 o'clock in the living room. And we're going to take... A simple piece of scripture and we're gonna open it up I'm gonna read the scripture and then we're gonna talk about it and I'll tell you so the art of parenting was eight weeks long we had a couple other disturbances there and so it ended up going more like ten weeks I noticed like this with the kids I mean it was it was amazing how in just a couple of weeks taking this to heart and looking at that and saying, it's my job as the father to lead this. And when we sat and actually took the word of God and started looking at scripture and digesting it, and, and William, man, he hit me with some tough, hard questions. Hard, hard, hard questions that sometimes we're like, okay, I need to step back a minute. These are tough ones to, to deal with, right? But I noticed a radical change instantly in the kids. Right? And it came from this. So, one of the most important things, too, is that Paul modeled for Timothy a godly character. Right? We just talked about that. If I live one way and then I'm outside, that's, that doesn't work. Um, I don't have it. Adrian, is my next slide the video? I think it is. Okay. I want to introduce a video for you, and I know we're running really late because we started late, but I think it's really important. Um, this is from, oh, don't start the video. Can you pause it for a minute? Thank you, Adrian. I appreciate it. You're doing a great job. Just one second. I apologize. Um, the Art of Parenting, we watched these videos, and it was based on a movie called Like Arrows. And I want to set up the scene because I, as I was editing the video, I didn't want to show the whole scene. But basically, 
Um, the daughter sneaks out of the house. She's out with a boy significantly older than her. He makes advances on her, and she fights back. And at that point, the screen kind of goes away. It's a Christian film, obviously. We're not going to show this stuff, right? Um, and the dad hears her screaming, and he comes running out the door as the boy pushes the girl out of the car onto the curb in front of their house and then speeds away. Okay? I didn't want to show that. I just thought I would talk through it. So they go in the house, and then the obvious thing happens that happens with teenagers. He's screaming at her. She's screaming at him. The mom's trying to figure out if she's okay. The mom starts screaming at her. She starts screaming at the mom. She slams the door, right? If you've had teenagers, you, or if you ever were a teenager, which, right, you, you know the scene. But you're laughing. Why are you laughing? <laughs> so anyhow, <laughs> that stuff happens, unfortunately. And after some prayer and um, reading the scripture, the dad goes and confronts the daughter. So when, he, when you hear and hear him talking about when I found you on the curb, that's the scene. Does that make sense? I just didn't want to show that scene. So Adrian, go ahead and roll the, the clip of the movie. Adrian, we just go past it. The sound's not working, so um, it's a powerful scene, though. But basically, the dad comes in, he apologizes, and he says, you were on that curb because of me, right? You were there because I failed. I stopped being your father. And he apologizes and breaks down to the daughter. And basically says, I stopped being your father, and I want to apologize. And then the girl apologizes, and she said, Dad, it was just comforting to have a male give me attention and show me love. And that's why I was on that curb, right? Or that's why I was in that car, right? One of the most powerful things we can demonstrate to our children is brokenness, right? Paul writes in Romans 3, right, that all have sinned, 323, all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And John, he says, if we say we have fellowship with him while we walk in darkness, we lie and do not practice the truth. But if we walk in the light, as he is in the light, we have fellowship with one another and the blood of Jesus, his son, cleanses us from all sin. But here's the critical part. Here's the critical part. The next verse. If we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. There is nobody that is perfect. Perfection is a lie. Right there. We say we have no sin. We deceive ourselves, and the truth is not in us. But if we confess our sins, he is faithful and just to forgive us, right, our sins and to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. If we walk around and act like we're perfect or pumped up, how are our kids supposed to relate to Jesus? Because the reality is your kids relate to Jesus through you. Your horizontal relationship with your kids is 100% dependent on your vertical relationship with God. And the reason the scene in that movie is so powerful is because the father comes and acknowledges that what put the girl on that curb, what put her in the car with that boy, was his failure to be a father. And he asked for forgiveness. Look, guys, the only way our kids are going to learn to ask God to forgive their sins 
is if they see us broken and humble and willing to come and ask for forgiveness. Until we can admit our own sin in front of our kids and they can see us confessing to God and us confessing to them, they're never going to learn to do it themselves. They're just simply going to learn to be little like Pharisees who run around trying to like hide their sin, right? They're going to run around trying to like be a perfect person and do things as if things bring salvation and then hide it whenever they make a mistake. Our greatest example as fathers on this earth is to be like our father in heaven. But that means we have to be here and we have to be willing to come to our children and say, I'm sorry, I messed up. And they have to be willing to see us ask God for forgiveness. Amen? Because that is the greatest way we can disciple our children. So if I look at it, Paul demonstrated to Timothy the gospel in practice through grace and restoration, right? The other great thing in that scene was the dad goes to the girl. He doesn't just confess to her, and she doesn't just confess to him. At the end of the scene, he restores her. He picks her up, right? And he restores their relationship, right? And they embrace each other, and, you know, he's like, hey, I need to take you on an ice cream date right? Dad, daughter, I need to be your date, right? He restores her, and we need to restore our children. So Timothy's godly character was formed in the home. It was through being allowed to lead and have responsibility. It was through mentorship and discipleship, and it was through Timothy witnessing the gospel lived out in Paul's life. And through that, he was able to have a godly character. So with that, I leave you back with my question. If we're to display God's character in our lives, and with Jesus as our example, whose character are you projecting? Whose character are you projecting? Let's go ahead. We're going to close really quickly in a song, and then from there we're, we're pray and go out. And I love this song. It's, it's Lord, You Have My Heart. And I want us to, like, let's stand, and let's sing this as a prayer. Oh, oh, oh. 
his character. That's what I want you to leave with. We need to search for the Lord. Amen. Amen. We need to seek him. And we need to make sure that our whore, our vertical relationship is right so that then we can extend our horizontal relationship to the world. And some of you today may be saying, look, I, you know, I don't have kids. Maybe you're online or you're here. And, but again, you have neighbors. You have youth in this church. And I'm going to tell you, you can reach out and impact kids. I remember watching my grandfather in his 70s still volunteering with the kids, taking them on canoe trips, taking them on hikes, participating in youth group when he was in his 70s, right? Impacting the youth of the church. Your grandparent, I'm telling you, when I look at my life, my grandparents, my great-grandfather, who I am today is shaped in a powerful way in the formation of my godly character from those women. Amen. And you as grandparents have a powerful, powerful place where you can touch your grandkids. Do not underestimate the power you have. With that, let's pray. Lord, Heavenly Father, Lord, we just thank you so much for the example of Paul with Timothy. Lord, we thank you for the example of how you took this young man, this teenager, and through Paul's discipleship and through the leadership of his grandmother teaching him the scriptures, he was able to be this silent character, this quiet character in the background yet was one of the most impactful characters in all of the New Testament. Leading churches, being Paul's messenger, this powerful right-hand side, even as a young man, as a teenager. Lord, I thank you for the youth in this church. Help us to lead them and help us as a church and as parents, as grandparents, as neighbors and friends to be able to help them form their godly character so that we can reach out and touch those around us. In thy name we pray, amen.